Today we're going to speak about hope and essential for 2020. And uh, just, I should say something before I come. I want to uh, welcome all the ones from Hurstbridge, Hurstbridge Christian Fellowship as well who are here today. We were going to have a meeting in the park today, but when we looked at the temperature uh, forecast, we thought that's not a good idea. So uh, a lot of them have come this morning, and uh, it's really good to see each of you here. So um, we're in the aftermath of Christmas, and, uh, but we're still in the Christmas story a little bit. And today, Pastor Lee read so well the story of Simeon and Anna and the baby Jesus in the temple. And we're almost uh, in that time period after the birth of Jesus. And um, I want to look at some of the things that are coming out of that story today. As you're all very much aware, we're in the last week of 2019. And if you're like me, you're probably saying, where in the world did that year go? And uh, I think the older we get, the more, with more alarm we say that. But even my own kids are saying that kind of thing too. And some of them are still in their teens. Um, this is a wonderful time that God has given us for a couple of things. One is reflection, looking back over the year, seeing what went well, what went not so well, reflecting on how our walk with the Lord Jesus has been, what we need to repent of, what we need to change in our lives. But it's also a really good time for looking ahead and looking ahead in hope. And I want us to concentrate this morning on looking ahead with expectation. Hope or expectation of the good is absolutely vital for our well-being, for our entire well-being, for the well-being of the body, the soul. We cannot live well without hope or expectation. I'm sure you'll agree with me in that. And I think it's been well um, documented that people who have survived the Holocaust, many of them say that the difference between them and someone who died during the Holocaust or during, um, say for instance, the Second World War. Yesterday I was speaking to a friend of mine whose father was in a prisoner of war with the Japanese. And his father bore this out. He said that what kept him alive in the midst of sickness was the hope of seeing his unborn son. Well, the son that was conceived while he was at home and then he was sent away to fight. He had never seen him. But it was that hope that kept him alive. Just imagine what mere hope can do. Hope that isn't necessarily founded in reality. Compare that with a hope that is founded in the God of the universe. What can that do in our lives? That expectation of the fulfillment of the promises of God. We were singing about the promises of God just then. I'm so glad we did. All his promises are yes and amen in Christ. I want us to see this morning that for those of us who are in Christ, there is a, a well founded hope and expectation, a securely founded hope and expectation in him, not just for 2020, but for the rest of our lives. And it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. That comes from Colossians chapter 127. Christ in us, the hope of glory, is what is able to sustain us at all times and all seasons, not just mere hope not just mere optimism. What is optimism, really? Optimism could be as vague as just having a disposition that always looks on the bright side, but it's not necessarily founded in anything real. But the hope and expectation that the believer has is founded in the creator of the universe, someone who knows all things, someone who is everywhere at all times, someone who is all-powerful. And this morning, we... I may be speaking to someone, maybe not just someone, but to quite a few people whose hope is faltering this morning. Things have happened beyond your control. This has been a bad year. You would say that the sum total of your experiences in 2019 have been negative. That's what you would say as you review your year. 
and your hope is failing. Please don't go into that space, brothers and sisters. If you are born again, Christ is in you. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Was he telling the truth when he said that? Let me hear a big yes. yes. He was telling the truth. That's right. Not a good question to be met with silence. <laughs> I will never leave you nor forsake you. But that doesn't mean things will not go wrong. My wife, Andrea, who's here today, she showed me a video this week of someone who posted on Facebook uh, a little video, and it was entitled, This Has Been My Year. And I don't know if you've watched that TV program called Wipeout, have you? <laughs> Uh, where these big beams come around and knock people into the water and uh, knock them off their uh, high uh, platforms. Well, it was this kid in a similar wipeout type situation and this big foam arm was coming around every 20 seconds or so. And every single time that kid stood up, he got wiped out again. Uh, hit him on the head, hit him on the stomach, threw him over, and the, the person was saying, this has been my year. Perhaps that's been your year and your hope is failing. I want to encourage you with these words that if you're a believer, Christ is in you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Perhaps there's someone who is not just at the hope is failing stage, but the hope is gone stage. All hope is gone. You call that despair. I want to tell you this morning, believer, for you and for anybody really in the world today. Despair does not belong in the world. Despair is for hell. Do you know what despair means? Despair means no hope or down from hope. It means that there isn't even a possibility of hope. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today and you say you're in despair, let me tell you that's not reality, that's lies. You can be realizing the hope of God because where does that hope reside? We just said Christ in you, the hope of glory. You cannot be in despair, real despair, brothers and sisters, if you believe truly that the one who is the source of all hope is residing in you. Please step back from despair. If you're thinking of ending your life, stay with us. Despair does not belong in you, nor does it belong in the church of Jesus Christ. So as we look ahead to 2020, what is your frame of mind this morning? Is it anticipation of something, expectation of something? Is it dread of something? Now, think for a quick moment. What is uppermost in your mind when you think of 2020? Just think. What's the first thing that comes to your head? You got it? Don't move on. Just that first thing. Is it the holiday that you're about to have? Is it that new job? Is it that new school or university that you're going to? Is it that new relationship? Or is it that old dysfunctional relationship? Is it that diagnosis? Is it getting to know the Lord Jesus better in 2020? Is it being free from debt? free from illness, free from addiction, or some other negative thing. Hold fast to that first thought that you had. And now ask yourself the question, what does this say about my heart? What has come to your mind, first and foremost, may say something about your heart. Don't let that condemn you but rather let it inform you. That thing, is it an anticipation, excitement, expectancy, or is it a dread? Now, regardless of what it is, dread or anticipation of something good, let us relegate it to expectancy in Jesus Christ and his promises. Let's do that this morning. Let's make Christ their focus. For Simeon and Anna, the Messiah was their focus. They've been looking forward to him coming for many, many years. 
we, we read here about Anna uh, looking forward to the Messiah coming for many years, possibly over 60. But how were they looking forward to the Messiah coming? Remember for them, they understood this concept of Messiah, one who would deliver Israel. How were they looking forward to it? I want us to have a look today at our modern understanding of what it means to wait for, to expect, and to hope. I want to take uh, three words and have a look at what they mean, and then continue on with a clearer understanding of what the Bible means by expectancy. The first word today for the concept of anticipation or hope that we look at is the word expect. And we use expect to say that we believe something will happen. For example, the man who is in prison, who has been given a parole date of the 30th of December, 2019, he expects to walk out those gates tomorrow. It's kind of a fact. You know why? Because the judge said he would be released on the 30th of December, 2019. That man expects to walk out those gates tomorrow. And then there's the word hope that we use every day in English, and it has come to mean this. We use hope in our English understanding when we do not know whether something will happen or not, but we want it to happen. For example, the man who's in prison for the rest of his natural life, he's been given a sentence, you will remain in prison for the rest of your natural life. He hopes for a parole date. He has no promise. He has no revelation. He has no expectancy of release. This is not the kind of hope that is a biblical hope. And we need to erase that kind of thinking from our mind. A biblical hope is more like this, looking forward expectantly to God's future activity in faith that it will happen, that it's going to happen. That's a biblical hope. So if we talk about hope from now on, we are talking about a strong expectancy based upon revelation and the promises of God. Not this kind of a hope, or that, or cross your legs and everything else. Not that kind of a hope. It's a certainty. And then there's the word wait. I don't know if you've ever associated hope and wait, but the Latin family of languages have always associated those two words. And in fact, the common Latin word um, in the Latin languages, Spanish, Portuguese, for wait and hope are the same word. And so when we refer to wait in English, we refer to the thing of letting time pass because we are expecting that something is going to happen. Letting time pass because we're expecting that something is going to happen. For example, the man who's been given a parole date for the 30th of December, 2020, he waits with expectancy that in one year and in one day, he will be released from prison. And he's got the word of the judge. So he's not got one of these hopes. He's got an expectancy, an expectancy that involves a wait, but a certain wait. And he knows that in one year and one day, he will walk free from prison. So fortunately in English, we have several words to help us. We have several words to distinguish the different nuances between what it means to wait and to hope. But it can also have a, a negative side in that it doesn't help us understand that there's a connection between waiting and hoping. So now that you know, let's just continue on with that knowledge. And because, just because, we associate hope with something that is very uncertain, let's change the use of that word for the purposes of this sermon to expectation and expectancy. Expectation is a noun, something that we have, something that we can hold. Expectancy is an attitude, something that flows out of us and others can see, and it actually changes our lives and other people's lives when we live in expectancy. Now remember, I'm not talking about mere optimism here. As we said before, mere optimism is, has got no basis, but expectancy has a solid basis in the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's have a look at Simeon and Anna. They're wonderful people 
who had a true expect expectation of something that would be fulfilled. They were sure about it. it. Not only that it would be fulfilled, but that it would be fulfilled in their time. So specific was the promise and the revelation that was given to Simeon that he knew that it would be in his time. And uh, as we said in the case of Anna, she was waiting for over 60 years, and surely Simeon was waiting for quite some time. The implication of the text is that it wasn't just a couple of weeks he was waiting. It was an implication that it could have been a long period of time as well. And what was he waiting for? He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And uh, as we look back to our definition of the words expect, hope, and wait, we can see that Simeon was in the category of expect and wait. Something was imminent in his life, and he was waiting for it expectantly. And we have the, also the English word anticipation. And I looked up the etymology of it, anticipation, and it's even stronger because it, it's made up of two Latin words, ante, which means before, and separe, which is to take. So you take before. It's the idea of knowing that something's going to happen and going after it and looking for it. So our, our English word anticipation is even stronger. But the Greek word that, that was used here in this text has to do with the idea of fulfillment of promises, the sure and certain fulfillment of promises. So Simeon was actually looking for, actively looking for the coming of the Messiah. He was actively involved in it. He wasn't sitting with his fingers crossed, his arms crossed, and his legs crossed, hoping for the coming of the Lord Jesus. He was actually going out and looking. These babies that were coming in to, be, uh, to have the ceremony of circumcision, he was probably looking at them to see which one would be Jesus. But we were very clearly told from the scriptures that the Spirit moved him and told him when the right one had come. That title, The Consolation of Israel, we'll just look at it for a moment. What does consolation mean? Well, I looked up the Greek word for consolation, um, having a fair idea of what I would find. And sure enough, the Greek word is paraklesis. Paraklesis. Any, maybe you know another word in the New Testament very similar to that, parakletos, which is comforter. So here we see a connection between the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Messiah, was the consolation of Israel. And when he was finished his work, he sent the, co the comforter. Jesus was the paraclesis. The Holy Spirit was the parakletos. And they come, they're derived from two Greek words, which mean to call near. In other words, presence. So when Jesus came into the world as the consolation of Israel, Israel did not recognize him, but he was God with us, Emmanuel. And when he sent the Holy Spirit after he left, he has sent another God with us. And this time he lives inside us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now Israel, the word Israel here, of course, is implying that the whole of the nation of Israel was looking to, for this consolation to come. But they had in their minds a different kind of a consolation. Israel was in subjection to the Roman Empire. They were no longer an independent state. And they were therefore looking for the Messiah to come and take up the sword and deliver them from the Romans. But this is not what God had in mind. Unlike Simeon and Anna, the people of Israel, in a general sense, had they came to reject their consolation, their comforter, as we know. And to, to this very day, the church largely consists of Gentile believers. Although what I've been hearing over and over again is that more and more Jewish people are trusting the Lord all the time. And I want to encourage us to pray in 2020 for the people of Israel, the Jewish people, that they would come to recognize their consolation and own them as Savior and Lord, and that they might have Messiah living inside them as well. It may well be that certain events that are happening in the world today um, are indicative of what has been foretold in the books of Ezekiel and Daniel and Psalm 83 and Revelation. 
Things are moving very fast, brothers and sisters. We could be at the cusp of the coming again of the consolation of Israel, the coming again of the Messiah, Jesus. Things are looking very, very like that. But of course, we don't know. But what that means for us is that we could be like Simeon and Anna, and not just hoping for that day, but expecting it. And ordering our lives in accordance with that expectation. If this were to be the last year of your existence, how would you live it? That's a question that we all need to ask every year, but 2020 is coming up. Lovely, lovely uh, number 2020. It speaks of perfect vision. May the Lord give us all a clear vision of what he wants us to do in this year. I don't think we can do what God wants us to do in this year unless we have that deep-seated, securely founded expectation that he fulfills his promises, that he has something planned for us. Ephesians 2, 8 says, uh, 2, 10 says, for you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has before ordained that we should walk in them. You know, being a Christian doesn't mean bad things will not happen. This year, in our little fellowship, um, we have seen many people suffer many illnesses. But you, you know what I want to tell you? Some of them still suffering, but some of them have been miraculously healed. This week, I was speaking to a lady. She happens to be a Jewess, but she's come to know the Lord. And uh, earlier in the year, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And uh, sure enough, the biopsy showed that she had a certain form of cancer. I met her on Christmas Eve in Mitre 10 in Diamond Creek. And uh, she told me with um, a wonderful sense of God's love that she has been medically verified to be healed from that cancer. She was having her last meeting with a specialist on her case. And this lady had not seen her up until that point, but she said, I have heard of your case because this is a baffling case. The cancer that this lady had is typical of a cancer that should be riddling her body. But when they went back to look for it, there was none, all gone. So she said, I'm a woman of faith. Could, would you describe this as a miracle? And the doctor said, well, we're not really supposed to use those terms, but let me say it again. We have no medical understanding of why this should be. The Lord healed her. Do you know what he used? He used a simple prayer and a little flask of cooking oil and he healed her. He did more than a multi-million dollar machine could do in a hospital. I just, I just said that because I want to build your hope and your expectation. It wasn't here on the notes, but um, perhaps you need to hear that to build you up. You need to hear that. I want to uh, continue on here by looking at the connection between expectation and revelation. In verse 26, it says there, it had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. What struck me about the story of Simeon was the number of times the Holy Spirit is mentioned in, in the story. Three times. Exactly the same number of times that Simeon's name is mentioned. And the Holy Spirit's role here was to reveal to Simeon that he would not see death before his eyes had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, we don't know how the Holy Spirit did that. It's not, it doesn't go into detail. Did Simeon derive this from the scriptures? Did Simeon receive a vision or a dream? Or was it a combination of all that? We don't know. The important thing is that we know that the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that he would not see death before his eyes would see the Lord himself, the Messiah. The Holy Spirit is a revealer 
He was the revealer of this future event. And it was so clear and so strong in the mind of Simeon that it raised up an unshakable and great expectation in his life. A great expectation that changed the course of his life, that changed his habits. He started looking for this Messiah now. He was waiting for him. And then I want us to look also at the connection between expectation and promise. In verse 29, it says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For Simeon, for Simeon, it's clear that he treated the revelation as a promise. The revelation of the Holy Spirit was the same thing to him as the promise of God. I do not think that the, the uh, revelation was different from the promise. And I believe that we as believers, we need to take what the Lord has revealed in his word, that revelation, treat it as a promise, a promise that he will fulfill. Which one of God's promises has he not fulfilled? Only those which he will yet fulfill. But every one that he has promised relevant to here and behind, he has fulfilled. And he will fulfill all the promises that come ahead. And that's the sort of God that we have to put our trust and our expectation in as we face 2020. And if you don't have that expectation this morning, ask him for it. Please ask him for it. Don't leave here without asking the Lord to build within you that great expectation. Of course, that will involve believing the Word of God. It will involve prayer. It just doesn't... We are God's co-workers, you know. We just don't get everything handed to us on a plate. He wants us to get into the Word. He wants us to get into prayer and trust Him. In regards to the words of knowledge that you may receive from a brother or sister, please test these words with Scripture and prayer. They are not the same as the Bible, but they may really be a message from the Lord to you. Then I want us to look at the connection between expectation and prophecy. Actually, the prophecy that came from Simeon after he had received that revelation and after that expectation had been built up in him, he prophesied. And verse 30 says, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what he had said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So let's look at the chain of events that led to this prophecy. A revelation from the Holy Spirit caused great expectation and trust, unshakable faith to arise in Simeon, which in turn led him to prophesy about Jesus and the future. Do you see how key revelation is in our lives? Now, what's the main revelation that we have as Christians today? It's this, it's the Word of God, the inerrant Word of God. This is our main revelation. Have you sorted out your Bible reading program for 2020? Or are you just going to wander haphazardly through 2020? Have you sorted it out? I want to ask you. You see, how many of you have a U version on your phone? How many of you got U version on your phone? Quite a few. You don't have any excuse. <laughs> there are so many Bible reading programs on that. And you can even do it in Russian if you want to, but you probably don't. There are so many uh, things out there. Or you can download, for instance, the Murray McShane reading plan on a piece of paper. For those of you who don't do technology, get a piece of paper with every day of the year, Bible reading plan, take it off. What I'm saying is, do something in this area. Be diligent in the area of revelation. And the Lord will build your faith and your expectation in him. And then you will be able to speak into the lives of others in a most effective way. Expectancy equips us for dark times, you know, and it sustains us. And if we understand true hope 
as great expectancy. In other words, a sense of real assurance that something is going to happen. Then it equips us for the dark moments of life. And this expectancy doesn't always have to be specific. In the case of Simeon, the expectancy was very specific. The Messiah is coming, you will see him. But, you know, if we have a general promise like Romans 8, chapter 20, uh, Romans 8 verse 28, that's enough. My goodness, it's enough. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That is a general um, revelation for the believer, which is true all the time. You may not be able to see it in your present situation, but trusting in the Lord with the hope inside of us, which is Jesus Christ, we can believe for sure that that bad thing which just happened to you will in one way or another, sooner or later, work out for your good and for the glory of God. Do you believe that? That's what the scripture says. That's a promise of God. If you take nothing else from here this morning, take that verse out with you into 2020 and believe it. I want to ask you, is Christ your expectation now? Simeon said, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles for the glory of your people Israel. Look, what was Simeon holding in his hands when he said that? Christ. A little baby. But what? Christ, yes. But what could that baby do there and then? What in the world could he do except cry, wave his arms? That's all he could do. But yet the eyes of faith were not in helplessness, but they were in what that baby would become. That was his expectation. It was in the Christ child. Did you come here this morning hoping to meet Jesus? You know, hoping? Hoping to meet Jesus? Or did you come here this morning expecting to meet Jesus? Do you see the difference? My prayer is that each one of us today would in fact meet Jesus this morning. It shouldn't be that hard, should it? Why? Where is he? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he's right in here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's right in here. Where does hope reside? Even for you who are on the point of, res of despairing, where does hope reside? Right inside you. Is that hope emanating from you? Is that where it has its origin? No. Nope. It has its, its origin in Christ, who is the hope of glory. He's in your spirit if you're a believer. Let him flow out. Let that hope that he brings flow out into your soul. Let it take away the darkness. Once your soul is flooded with light, your body will change too. Grab onto this hope, brothers and sisters, today. Is Christ your expectation for the future? Not just today. And just as Simeon and Anna were expecting the arrival of the Messiah, we believers must be expecting the arrival of Messiah again. Mark 2. It could, be, could well be that just as Simeon was promised that he wouldn't die before he would see the Lord's Messiah, it is very possible that maybe someone alive today will receive that promise too. But regardless of whether you receive that promise or not, we need to live in that expectancy. It may not be long before he comes again, as I said before. Are you anticipating his return? Or does it fill you with dread? Perhaps you're not a believer this morning. You don't know Jesus, or you're not sure you know Jesus. Then the thought that he would come again would possibly fill you with dread. I remember that dread. I remember sitting in, in school in second form, and um, all of a sudden there was this loud trumpet blast, very loud trumpet blast, came from somewhere. It was a port portable next door, and I thought the Lord had returned. <laughs> And I didn't go anywhere. I just, I just remained in my seat, and I thought, oh, no, that's terrible. I was so filled with dread and fear, uh, but greatly relieved when I discovered that the English teacher next door 
had put on the tape recorder, but he put it on at full volume. Anyway, I remember that dread. Perhaps you are dreading the Lord's return. You don't need to dread it any longer. Trust in him as your Lord and Savior. Come to him today. Let him reside inside you. Let him give you that hope that you need. And he will change the course of your life. May the Lord enable each one of us to enter into 2020 with the full expectation that the Lord Jesus lives inside us and that all things will work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. May the Lord bless each one of you. Amen.